This is lecture 13. Uh, we're going to look at transcription factor bonding site recognition in S. cerevisiae today. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is the uh, first lecture in part three of the course where we're going to focus on modeling, which is something we've talked a little bit about, but not very much. There is a part four of the course, which is down here, looking at how we communicate our results and at issues of reproducible science. But for the next lectures, we're going to be focusing on a collection of problems. Some of them, excuse me, classic computational challenges like binding site recognition today, gene finding, and some of them are modern areas like single cell transcriptomics. Some of the problems are, are areas um, are, I know that your supervisors uh, and profs here uh, are interested in those kinds of questions. So, um, uh, you know, what is modeling? And, and I won't go deeply into describing what a model is in some theoretical sense, but let me give an intuition of um, our perspective, let's say, rather than an intuition. We talked about already this concept of the black box in um, computer science, right, in software engineering. And the black box is a way of... Um, uh, thinking about functions that, you know, you, kn you know what the input is and you know what the output is and it's, the box is black because, you know, you don't really care what goes on in there as long as it's correct, right? So as you, long as you know what to give it and what to expect out, you're pretty happy and you don't need to know the details of how it was implemented uh, at all. Um, well, you know, is that really much different than biology? I, I mean, if we were to say that the cell, for example, at that level, one could have more complicated discussions here about physiology and organs and how cells interact in an organism, etc., or with their microbiome, etc. So it gets, you know, confusing. But, you know, a cell has also input in that sense. It's not passing arguments to a function, but it is um, the environment, uh, chemical stressors, genetic perturbations, um, uh, all these kinds of factors that influence the cell produce some kind of output. So the output is not text to a screen, but it might be a phenotype. Uh, it might be um, a molecular change that we can't witness, say, under a microscope, but uh, you know, it's still something that occurs. It preconditions the cell, perhaps, in some way, molecularly. It prepares the cell. For example, if I stress a cell with um, uh, heat shock, for example, uh, you might not see outwardly how the cell changes physically, yet lots of different stress pathways might be initiated um, at the transcriptional and protein levels that then prepare that cell for future challenges. So isn't biology really about uh, deciphering the inputs and outputs of a cell? And the cell is somewhat of a black box, right? We don't really know how it's wired. And um, well, we, we could try to figure out how it's wired. So that would be what's called reverse engineering, right? So whereas, uh, y you know, uh, forward engineering is that we're building um, something new according to what we want. You know, we want to meet certain design specifications, which are basically input-output requirements, right? In reverse engineering, we're given the object and we're trying to figure out what inputs will produce what outputs. And, and that would be a little bit like you're given a function in a programming language and you don't have the uh, user manual. So you don't know what the inputs are and the outputs are. And so the challenge would be to reverse engineer what that function does. And you can imagine that'd be pretty tricky to do. And not surprisingly, biology is pretty tricky to do. So in a way, though, we maybe are happy not to understand or content, let's say, to not understand everything that goes on in a cell. And so, you know, we model the cell, right? We, we don't necessarily uh, model it down to the last molecule of water. Um, we abstract from the notion of a cell at the, quote, right level, 
that we can make sense of the inputs and outputs, you know, the perturbations and responses. So there's a lot of subjectivity in that. What, what do we mean by the right level of detail, etc.? cetera? But um, that's something that's very domain specific and it's, it's specific to what we want from um, uh, the study that we're doing. There's no easy answer to that really. But in, in a way, we can think of um, biology as really being reverse engineering of, of the cell. Okay, so I won't say much more about what a model is right now and just use examples as we go along. Uh, and why are they important? I think we can look at those individually, but um, in each context, some more. There are a ton of different types of models out there and picking the right model to use in any given situation is an art un un unto itself. And we'll try to convey some of those um, choices and design decision. Uh, and then we get into um, concepts from machine learning and that includes ideas of how do we parameterize or train a model. In other words, Models usually have some number of unknown variables or hidden variables or latent variables, as they're sometimes called. And we use uh, examples of both positive and negative. Um, for example, we might use a known binding site uh, and, or a set of known binding sites and a set of sites in the genome that we know are not binding sites and use that to uh, train our model. So. Yeah, a, a big part of what we're going to talk about here is machine learning. And then it, it gets into two interrelated issues of how do we evaluate the performance of a model? So how do we measure that mathematically or statistically? So with concepts of specificity and sensitivity, uh, accuracy, positive predictive value, other, these are other kinds of statistical measures. And, and ultimately, how do we then validate the model in terms of the underlying biology? Do, is the model really reflecting, um, you know, uh, is it able, able to predict, basically. So, you know, can it um, uh, identify transcription factor binding sites in uh, a manner that's better than, say, random? So the old adage is that um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And that goes back to this idea of at what level do we um, abstract? Uh, we're not going to model a cell right down to individual water, mo water molecules. We're going to try to get away with as much of a, a cartoon-like image of the cell as possible for the, um, the uh, uh, application at hand. Okay. So, we're going to start with um, transcription factors in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's Baker's yeast, uh, partly because it has a very small genome and only about 6,200 genes. Um, so we're going to start by a little bit of description of what are transcription factors themselves as DNA binding proteins. And how can we find out which proteins in S. cerevisiae are transcription factors? And then start to look at um, the, the biology of what transcription factor binding sites are. So what uh, physical chemical properties of the cell um, impinge on what a binding site is. And then finally, we're, that leads us into how we actually computationally locate them in S. cerevisia. So in other words, what kind of model are we going to build the, um, for those physical processes so that we can identify uh, where these um, transcription factor binding sites might bind. Okay, so um, by definition, uh, TF is a protein that regulates the rate of transcription from DNA to mRNA by binding to specific regions of DNA. Some people might have a slightly more liberal definition of a transcription factor that may not need to bind DNA directly, but um, um, participate as a cofactor that brings other proteins, um, like other transcription factor proteins, um, in contact with DNA. But we'll use this more uh, um, restrictive definition here. And in general, TFs often work in a coordinated fashion. Now the model we're gonna to build today, so this is the first example of a simplification, is that the TF works alone, um, but in general, they work in, um, together in a complicated ensemble that uh, upregulates um, the target gene. 
and I have a, a couple slides coming up to show that more. But for now, uh, the TF binds DNA through a, D, a DVD or a DNA binding domain. So there's a specific um, protein domain in the transcription factor that's responsible for it physically inter interacting with the DNA in a very controlled way. Um, and that, that uh, amino acid sequence is called the DVD. And so every transcription factor essentially has a slightly different DVD, and that's what determines um, the binding site. So I have two, two movies here. Um, this TF's the movie, that's, that's uh, short. I won't play that here. I would, and I think this was uh, in recommended reading, but not uh, mandatory. The Oxford link le lecture is very good. It's short. Um, it's not working from here right now, um, but I'll, it's only maybe 10 minutes long at the most, but I highly recommend that just so that we're on the same wavelength um, in this lecture. So yeah, this is the picture I was referring to earlier. So um, this is the actual gene down here. Okay, so your tar start of transcription is um, here. Uh, this green region is what we would refer to as a promoter and in yeast, that may just be a few hundred BP upstream base pairs, BP upstream of the gene, gene itself. And this is the uh, rest of the uh, chromosome um, coming down here. So uh, we can talk about the cis regulatory region or promoter, and that's just directly upstream. And then you have things like enhancers, et cetera, that might be quite distal or trans to the gene. And we're not going to worry about those today. They're, they're you know, real, but uh, it's... Um, uh, it's added complexity, and we're not going to mo modify, or not going to model those. Um, so there's a lot of factors at play here, including the DNA superstructure, how it's conformed in three-dimensional space, etc. But um, what we're what we're just basically looking at is the site-specific transcription factor that would be this guy, that's actually binding to the um, the promoter region. But you can see there's all sorts of other. Uh, um, activators and other proteins that, that bind with the transcription factors, say. And those that binding and that ensemble is what kicks up the RNA polymerase, and that's why you get transcription. But again, we're really just looking here today at how this purple protein, this transcription factor, binds to the DNA. In yeast, there are basically um, five different folds or protein domains, um, DVD domains. Um, and so I, I think that there's about 200 uh, transcription factors in yeast, and they all basically are degenerate versions of one of these five different domains. And uh, this is the BZIP, GCN4 is a pretty famous transcription factor uh, um, in yeast. Uh, so they, that's a kind of interesting, just two alpha helices that you can see how they um, interact in that major groove of the DNA. And these are uh, zinc fingers. Um, I think these are zinc these are also zinc clusters, both of these. There's zinc finger and there's zinc cluster. And I'm not sure what these ones are here. But you can see there's different you know, structures, protein structures, that interact with the DNA. Um, oh, yeah, so I, I wanted to say is that this video back here, uh, TF's the movie, um, yeah, it's not uh, working from here. But uh, I highly recommend watching that because it shows how the transcription factor moves down the DNA strand. Okay, so the DVD binds DNA in a semi-specific manner, we could say. Uh, in other words, the location where the TF binds DNA via the DVD is characterized by a so-called degenerate motif. Um, so these two figures try to capture that notion. Here uh, we have A, C, G, and T, the four nucleotides. And then this is position one of the transcription factor binding domain, or uh, sorry, the binding site. And this is position two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, I don't know what that is. Was that position, let's say, uh, 21 or something, right? Um, corresponding to positions one through 21 here. And this is called a DNA logo. And basically the height here, um, or it's the, the, the ratio here of the different nucleotides is how often they're tolerated in any one specific position. So here you see that at position eight is that you always get a T essentially. And if I was to come over here 
in this um, figure and look up eight, I would see that basically every, um, it should be that every, almost every nucleotide at that position will be a T. There's a little bit, I think, of A's in there you can see, but it's very small. Same thing for positions 10, 12, and 14. These are all very highly determined positions in the binding site. But positions like here, here, and here, they're more variable. So it, it seems that about 50% of the time, it's an A and 50% it's a G at this position. And that would be, okay, I should come back here and explain this a little bit more. These numbers are from uh, uh, known binding sites for this particular transcription factor, GCN4. And so what this means is that at position one, um, of all the known binding sites for GCN4, 218 had an, had an A, 295 had a C, 245 for a G, and 240. So basically, it's equal. And if we look down here at position one, it, all four of the nucleotides are equiprobable, essentially. This actually is not probability, it's information, but we don't need to worry about that. It's called, it's an information theory metric, but we don't need to worry about that. The intuition here though, like if I look here at this position, 973 times it's a T, six, eight, and 11 times it's not. So it's really always a T and that's position eight, I believe. Okay, so um, we're driving this motif from known examples of binding sites in the genome. Now, how do we know these binding sites? Like, where does this count matrix come from? That might be from experiments like Celex that determine uh, where the transcription factor is binding or some kind of pulled up chip, chip seek type method. It depends these days. There's multiple ways of determining the binding sites for any transcription factor. Okay, so uh, bind transcription factor binding uh, prediction, there's basically two versions of it. The first one, which we're going to look at today, uh, is that we know the DNA binding motif for a transcription factor. So in other words, we have some matrix, a count matrix like this, and from that we can derive some kind of like motif like this. And uh, we want to know where the additional binding sites in a genome are, in our case um, for S. cerevisia. So uh, yeah. We know the binding site, but we want to find all the places in the genome where it's actually binding. Um, the motif is modeled using this, what's going to call, be what's called a position weight matrix, and we're going to define that in a few minutes. Um, and, uh, well, there's different versions of this fundamental problem, and often, um, what we do is a technique called phylogenetic footprinting, which means that we don't look just at S. cerevisia in isolation. We would collect the genomes of several closely related species. So in our case, maybe that would be other fungi um, that span uh, some evolutionary distance. Like you, you, you want to have a kind of a non-trivial amount of evolutionary distance. And you would align those um, those regulatory, those promoters, for example, and then you would use the conservation across the organisms uh, as a way of um, further refining your predictions for where a transcription factor might bind. Okay, so simply put, you know, if I look in a position in a promoter and it looks like it might be a place where a, a transcription factor might bind, my belief that it's tr a truly a binding site would increase if I saw that it was conserved across other fungi. But if it's not conserved across other fungi, then I might not believe as strongly that it's actually a true positive. And, and the basic fund, you know, the principle of that is just that if it's an important site, then it, evolution will, will select for it. Um, if it's not important, then you'll just get random evolution there. We're not going to look at phylogenetic footprinting in this course, but the industrial strength versions of transcription factor binding consider those kinds of issues. But there are a lot of packages out there. Maybe the most famous one for this approach is called PhiloScan. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to build our own basically today so that we can understand the, fundam the fundamentals for this kind of approach uh, or this problem of um, identifying uh, binding, um, uh, binding sites. The second version 
of this problem is, is distinct. So here, we don't know the binding motif for a specific transcription factor. So we know perhaps that the transcription factor has a DNA binding domain, but it, it's not possible really to look at that DNA binding domain alone and determine exactly how it's going to interact um, with DNA. So we were not, it's, I, I don't think it's possible to really deduce the DNA binding motif with high you know, accuracy from the DBD alone. So um, in this problem here, uh, we want to know, we want to learn what that binding motif is. Uh, so uh, we won't look at this today, but one way that we would do it in general, uh, the general approach here is that we would take uh, a collection of known promoters for a set of, um, a set of genes okay, that we believe are regulated by the transcription factor. So you know, we might do a gene expression study where we overexpress GCN4. And those genes that go up in expression or, or down in expression significantly, we might then conclude or, or hypothesize that they're regulated by GCN4. And so if they're regulated by GCN4, a transcription factor, then it might be the case, it's reasonable to believe that the promoters for these genes would have a common motif that represents the binding site for that, for GCN4, right? And there's different packages out there and they deal with slightly different versions of this problem. The most famous one perhaps is MEME. Meme. Um, it's actually a suite of different tools, uh, but MEME, the, the classic approach basically, it takes an input of DNA uh, for, uh, of related sequences and then identifies those motifs that are common across those sequences um, more than what we'd expect by chance. Uh, and Homer is a bit distinct conceptually. Um, yeah, so there, uh, basically we're taking a set of genes that we believe are you know, highly expressed uh, by the transcription factor and a second set which are basically random pieces of DNA that we don't believe are enriched for the, for the motif. And um, it basically does some kind of fancy statistics to identify those motifs that are enriched in the first set but depleted in the second set, or at least uh, only appearing randomly in the second set. And we'll come back to those concepts a bit more as we move along. Okay, so the first question is, how can we find which proteins in yeast are actually transcription factors? And for that, we might use what's called the Gene Ontolo Ontology Consortium. Okay, so uh, GO, or Gene Ontology, short as GO, is one of the oldest um, bioinformatics efforts, international bioinformatics efforts. It's really a consortium. And, and there's two aspects of um, GO. One is the ontology itself. Now, ontology is kind of a strange word, and the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't really help. But you can think of it basically as a, um, a categoriz categorization uh, of every gene in terms of what its function is where uh, its um, gene product is, exp uh, is expressed to where it resides. In, for, you know, for example, in the nucleus, the nucleolus, or in the ER, etc. And the, pro the processes that the gene product might actually carry out or participate in. For example, is it a stress protein? Uh, is it involved in transcription or translation? Is it a, an enzyme that's involved in a metabolic pathway? Essentially, uh, Go has been this international effort to categorize every possible function, location, and um, process in a, a, a living cell, regardless of which species, right, across the, the whole tree of life. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like in a, in a few seconds. But so, so that's the first property of Go. It's the ontology itself. It's basically a lot of people sitting down for a long time and trying to pigeonhole uh, everything into this, um, this network of uh, function, location, and process. And, that, and that's kind of a model, right? That's a, a model of the living cell. The second part then is a, a mapping for each organism, whether it's human or, or yeast, et cetera, of each gene into those different categories. So you, you want to identify every stress gene in yeast, you want to identify every transcription factor, etc. 
And that, that tells you then, you know, basically in, 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 to go back to our problem here is we want to locate those um, proteins in, in SAC that uh, are Saccharomyces SAC, uh, that are transcription factors. Okay, so to give you an example, um, we're going to switch over to a tool called Amigo, which has a nice graphical um, uh, approach. So if I come over here at the root of the uh, gene ontology, I see there's three components, our process, component, and function categories. And if I click on the, uh, to expand them, uh, I can see that molecular function opens up to a bunch of things, everything from antioxidant activity um, down to protein tag, transporter activity, etc. And uh, one of these is binding. Uh, so if I click on binding, I can drill down even further and I see there's all sorts of different kinds of binding from drug binding and chromatin binding. Um, there should be one in here called uh, protein binding. Uh, where is it? Right here. Because a transcription factor is a protein that binds. And if I click on that, I can drill down even further. And, and you can see here that these are uh, not necessarily yeast, right? This is across all organisms. Uh, so uh, it's quite big. And now if I, if I scroll down, I believe there's one that's called transcription factor binding. Uh, yeah, transcription factor binding. And if I go into transcription factor binding, I can see that there's actually different types of transcription factors from DNA binding and RNA binding. And if I click, and then transcription cofactor binding, which goes back to those complications that we're not modeling in this approach today. So if I go into DNA binding and I click down, I can see that there's activating uh, transcription factor binding and repressing transcription factor binding um, in addition some other esoteric uh, um, uh, processes or uh, functions and if I click on activating transcription factor binding I see there's RNA you know it keeps breaking down over and over again and if I click keep clicking on this I end up at a leaf and if I click on that I get a definition and I can get all the gene products associated with that category all right so it's an, inc an incredibly useful tool for exploring the function of genes and gene products in an organism now for saccharomyces cerevisiae once again we have the luxury of having sgd the yeast genome database and if i go over here to function i believe i can uh, go to gene ontology and uh, there's a, a Go built, or let's say the Go stays the same. That first part, that ontology is the same. But the mapping from genes to those categories is, of course, specific here just for yeast. And there's a bunch of tools that have been built to explore Go. One of them is the slow, uh, Go Slim Mapper, uh, which is basically a reduced... Um, it's go but reduced really just for the main categories for that organism in this case here for for sac and um, we can take and download this go slim mapping file if i click on that uh, it downloads it's only about 2.8 um, mega uh, mega um, bytes and i've already taken that that go mapping for yeast and put it into uh, project in our studio and I wrangled that into a tibble and I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So uh, this this question here, how can we find out which proteins in SAC are transcription factors? It's via Go that we're going to do that and when we go into our studio cloud I'll show you concretely how to filter rows of a tibble to find those. Okay. But before going to our studio cloud and showing you Go and um, our model in code, I'm going to switch to some notes to describe a little bit about the arithmetic that undersits our model, under, underlies our model for binding sites. Uh, and um, I won't come back to these slides. There's some points of reflection, but they're also um, uh, in the class page from the syllabus, so you can get to them there too. Uh, and I, I, we don't need to read these now because they're a little bit, uh, uh, they, you won't understand them until we get through the rest of the slides. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to some notes. Okay, so let's go through a little bit about the model 
the mathematics of our model for transcription factor binding sites. So we'll start off here with a bunch of sites that we know or we believe strongly are um, true positives in the meaning that they actually are binding sites for the target transcription factor. So this is a very simple alignment of these different binding sites. Um, the first one has ACTCT, so this is a, a motif of length 5. Uh, and you can see that everywhere, all six examples for that binding site are A's. However, for the second position, we can see that four of, of um, six are C's and two are G's. So there's some degeneracy. One A versus five T's, uh, four C's, or is it five C's, sorry, and one G. And uh, two versus four, A versus T. Okay, so... Uh, later on, we're, we're going to term this to be the uh, positive learning set or sometimes the, the gold standard set. Now, what we do here is pretty straightforward. We simply replace the observed binding sites by a, a, a count matrix, um, ACGT versus the five positions, six A's, zero for everything else because we had all A's, four versus two CG's, all the way down to two A's and four T's for this column here. I think that's pretty straightforward. So it's your count matrix. And from that, you form your probability matrix, which is just basically normalizing each count for each nucleotide X. So this means uh, for each X, that's A, C, G, or T, and divided by uh, the sum over all nucleotides, Y and A, C, G, T. So that's, that means sum, right? So in the first case here, uh, because six of six are A's, it has a uh, one here and zero elsewhere. Uh, one third, two out of six of the examples are G. So it's one third, two thirds, all the way down to one third A, two third T's, uh, two of six and four of six binding sites respectively. So that's pretty straightforward too. I don't think there's any particular uh, conceptual difficulty there. Okay, so now if we wanted to calculate the probability of a specific uh, motif, let's say X. Now here, uh, sometimes we refer to this as a, a sliding window. That's a term that maybe I should introduce here. Uh, the sliding window. So we can imagine sliding this window of, of uh, five uh, base pairs long across the genome from let's say left to right. And this would be from one, two, three, four, five, and then you go from two, three, four, five, six, and then three, you know, we would we would tile or shift this sliding window all the way across uh, so that every possible position in the, in the in along the chromosome was considered for this last motif, ending at you know the, the last position minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. So that last uh, um, possibility there. But for any particular position, let's say here, motif X, if we observed ACTCT in the genome, then we could compute the probability of that motif X as the product of the individual nucleotides, PX1, probability of X1, probability of X2, down to the probability of X5. So now we would use our probability matrix to fill in those probabilities, right? So here, PX1 is 1 because it's an A, right? X1 is an A, and so that's 1. So it, it, even stopping there, so if it wasn't an A here, it would have probability 0, right? Uh, and the whole thing would be equal to 0 because 0 times the product of anything, of course, is 0. The second position is a C, so we'd come in here and say, okay, what is a C worth? And it's 2 thirds. So we replace that, and so on and so forth for the, the last three positions by looking up in the respective last three columns. And, and that allows us to compute a probability here, which is slightly less than um, one-third. Uh, so, um, right. Uh, now, we, now, if the motif foot changes, we would still compute it the same way. Let's, for example, here's a, here's a good second example. A, G, A, G, A. It's definitely different than this motif here. Uh, 
A gets probability 1 again. G will get 1 third. A is 1 sixth in this position. 1 sixth. And so you get 1 over 300, which is much less probability than, than this sequence here. Right? And it, you know, if we look back at our examples uh, above, um, the first motif, ACTCT, uh, you could talk about a consensus, right? So if I asked what, what sequence or what, what's the, mo the motif that appears the most in here, well, you might say, well, it would be A here because the majority are A's. This is mostly C's. These are mostly T's. These are mostly C's. And these are mostly T's. So A, C, T, C, T. That would be your, your consensus sequence. Now, we were looking at this one here, which is A, C, T, C, T, which is, in fact, that sequence there. And that has a very high probability. And you can see, I think, intuitively, that this motif, A, G, A, G, A, is much less probability, right? That it's less likely than this guy up here. And here's a third example that uh, hints on a fundamental problem with this approach, T, A, T, A, T. Now, the probability of T is zero. So this whole thing is equal to zero. So that's very strict. And this is a problem uh, that has to do with when you, well, that's common when you don't have a lot of data. So we formed our position weight matrix from just six examples of known binding sites. And so, you know, we, we might be a little bit overly conservative saying that there's absolutely 0% chance that T would be in the first base of the motif. I, I mean, it's possible that T can never be there. But if we were to actually go and catalog, let's say, 100 binding sites from the organism instead of just six, would at least one have a T. And so, you, you know, there's, there's a difference between uh, in, in mathematics, when, when, a, when this probability is a zero, the whole thing becomes zero. It's very strict, right? It's very strict. And it may be incorrect to be so strict because maybe one in a hundred motifs does allow a T. Now, that's, that's still going to make this motif down here, um, this motif down here is still going to be very unlikely because a lot of these positions actually have zeros, but uh, it wouldn't be completely zero. So um, that's, that's really common. And that's probably be because we don't have a lot of examples here, right? Our, 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 our positive learning set, which is hard to form because it requires often experimental methodology like Celex or something like that to determine binding sites, it's usually limited, right? It's usually costly both in time and money to go and get examples of positive binding sites. I mean, you're modeling because you want to do this really cheap assay, essentially, that predicts binding sites for free, except for the computation in your computer. But, you know, uh, you need something to start with, and that part is expensive. And, and so, because data is usually limited, you have this problem that low occurring events, like maybe a T in position one, aren't there in your learning set. Now, so what do people do about that? Well, a common technique in this field, in modeling, is to use what are called pseudo counts. Uh, and it's a method to incorporate prior beliefs. That's the term that we'll come back to more and more now, when faced with sparse data. Now, sparse means that we don't have many examples here, only six. So, so basically, what we do is and say, okay, it's like, okay, look, you know, I didn't observe a T or a C or a G in position one, but I don't believe it's completely impossible in this universe that a T could be there sometimes in position one. Maybe if I had collected a hundred motifs, it would work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add basically one to each column. And that's, that, that kind of, this is a very simple form of pseudo count. There's more complicated versions based on the Dirichlet. Uh, distribution, but for now we can just add basically p to every column, and we can just stay with p equal to one. Usually you add a small constant like one or two or three. So how does that work now? Basically, what we do is we recalculate our matrix now, so that um, the, the columns each sum up to uh, what they were before plus one. So the first column previously summed to six. Make sure we can see that. The first column previously summed to six, and now we're going to make it sum to seven. And so what we'll do is we'll add 
1 over 4, n is the number of nucleotides, and p is equal to 1. So 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 quarter to every entry in this matrix. And so when we do that, we get an adjusted probability, uh, probability matrix that looks like this. Whereas before it said, you, you know, 6, 0, 0, 0, and 6, uh, 0, 4, 2, 0. Remember that. Now we have, uh, oops, I'm sorry, 6 and a quarter, a quarter where all the zeros were, a quarter, 4 and a quarter, 2 and a quarter, and a quarter, etc. Okay, so now what we've done is we've gotten rid of those zeros, right? Just by adding in this tiny count. So it's like adding a count that basically one is like adjusting your learning set in a tiny way so that you, you will rid these zeros. Now, now if I recalculate this, this motif T A T A T that used to be equal to zero, now it's going to be a quarter times a quarter times five over a quarter time. So now we've gone from five before to five and a quarter and four and a quarter. Okay, so now this value, I'm not sure what it is, but it's definitely above zero. It's no longer exactly equal to zero. So these, these positions that used to be zeros, these three, now aren't zeros. And so we get some kind of more meaningful score from it that's above zero. Okay, so, you know, if you have one position uh, that's a zero, everything after it, no matter how long this motif is, becomes zero. And, th and that's not a very desirable property. So by, by adding the pseudo count in, we avo avoid those extreme situations. So the second thing is that another small mathematical convenience, well, uh, not another one, it is a small mathematical convenience, is that we, we, okay, so I said before that we would compute for our motif of length n, the product of the probability, so x1 times x2 dot 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 times p of xn, so every position. That's a bit inconvenient in computers to be multiplying probabilities because each of these probabilities might be quite small. And when you multiply them, they get very close to zero very quickly. And that can cause all sorts of problems uh, when these are large motifs that with the computer. And that's just the nature of computers that they don't like small fractions. Uh, and and they're, it's kind of hard to interpret those really small numbers. So typically what we do is just use um, the, log, the log of sums instead of the uh, product here. So we just take the log. So the log of p at x is just equal to the log of p at x1 plus the log of p at x2, etc. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a pretty simple, straightforward thing. The, the main thing is that, uh, I guess the observation here is that if you have a motif x and uh, the probability of x, you'll get a probability for x. And uh, if you have a motif y, you'll have a probability for the motif y. So if p at, uh, of x is less than p of y, right, less than or equal to, then the log of p of x is less than or equal to the log of p at y. So the order remains the same. So it's not the case that, you know, the motif x in this space um, ends up, that it is, is smaller than uh, y, but you know, when you take the logs, it somehow becomes bigger. That doesn't happen that way. So uh, when you're asking about finding the, um, the, the, the highest scoring motif, Y is still going to be the highest scoring motif, right? So nothing changes that way. Okay, so now uh, I want to switch to our Studio Cloud to start showing you some, you know, concrete examples of how to search for binding sites uh, in, in SAC. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we are in uh, our studio. I've created this project called L13 to make everything a bit more concrete on with respect to binding sites. I'm using a notebook, uh, which if you run each of these R chunks, um, you'll and then then knit it with this preview, hitting this preview button, you'll get a nice presentation that's um, located here in this tfps.notebook.html. And if I click on that, I'll get this nice presentation here that we can go through with all of the figures uh, and text all in one spot. 
uh, I want to show you a little bit behind the scenes first. The, uh, my setup um, R chunk loads libraries that we know well, sets a path to data. I want to use version 1.0, but what you haven't seen before is this idea of um, the source function. So we can look at this file called utilities.r, and it contains nothing more than that function I wrote at the end of last class uh, to find attributes in that last column of the um, the go annotation. Uh, oh, sorry, of the um, of uh, the annotations for um, uh, the yeast genome. So by putting them into a file like that, all of your self-defined functions and putting them in utilities all together and sourcing them, what source does is basically just load everything in that file and execute it. So now if I go to uh, my session and I type in um, find uh, attribute, I can see it pops up in my global environment and I, it's, it's accessible to me. So it keeps my code a little bit more modular and it keeps all of my functions in one spot. Okay, so back to the nice view. The first thing I need to do is load all my uh, can, uh, S. cerevisia information. That includes the annotations of the genome that we looked at last class, the actual genomic sequence, and some information about the, um, the, the names of each chromosome. Uh, okay, so that's just from last class. The next thing I need to do is grab the Go mapping for the, the geontology information from SGD, and that's the link I used right there in the file called Go Slim Mapping. And if you go to uh, back to our file system and look under raw, it's right there, and it's not very big at 2.8 um, megabytes. So that's not a problem. Now, what I need to do is get that file into a tibble. So I used um, the read TSV, the tab separated um, value file. Uh, in, of that file that's in the raw directory. Uh, and when it loads it up, it creates, well, you can see that there's seven columns in total. It's not very informative that way, so we can take a look back in the session here and do a view on initial. And you can see here that the first three columns really are all gene names of some sort, um, HRA1, and they change a little bit over time. The most consistent, but uh, well, is this third one that's probably an SGD identifier, but in, it's not human readable really, it's just a code. Uh, and, and these guys here seem to be changing a little bit. Sometimes when a gene isn't well annotated, it just goes to some kind of default code too. Now recall that Go has three categories, cellular component C, molecular function F, and P for process. So the first uh, co gene, which is actually a non-coding RNA, is HRA1, and uh, we don't know, where, they don't know where it's localized, but it's a ribosomal RNA processing unit, so I guess it's nuclear. Uh, ICR1 is the second, it's located in the nucleus. It's, its molecular function isn't really well understood or annotated, and it's involved in transcription from uh, um, the polymerase to promoter. LSR1, it's located in the nucleus, it's involved in RNA binding and splicing, etc. And so for all 6,275 genes, we now have the annotations in um, our session. So I, I wrote this back to a file just so that now it, we can add it to our um, increasing Go uh, yeast annotations. And then uh, what I need to do is find those rows, right, the observations in our tibble that are labeled as transcription factors. So to do that, I take my initial uh, tibble, I pipe it into a filter, and then use the string de detect function on X5. Now X5 is that, um, well, I'll show you just to make sure. X5 is this column here, the labels of what these genes do in English. Um, so I, I choose anything that has transcription factor in it, and then I perform a distinct uh, to make sure that there's no duplicates, and I count and at the end I get some 275 putative, I want to stress putative transcription factors. I, I mean, there could be, um, of course, uh, other things in that table that aren't really transcription factors, and we'd have to check over each one. I did check, though, in the literature, and yeast track database had found 169 transcription factors in 2000, 2006, so perhaps we're not very far off.
and, and most of the guys I looked at seemed like transcription factors, so I think we're in good shape. Okay, so now um, uh, let's, I decided let's start with ARR1. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with that transcription factor, so if I come in here and just search for ARR1, I see that it's labeled as both nu nuclear and cytoplasmic. I mean, presumably as a transcription factor, it would be in the nucleus, um, it's, res it's involved in some kind of response to chemicals, so perhaps um, in, in a drug response, et cetera, drug stress. Uh, so that's a starting point. Now, we need the position weight matrix or the position count matrix. So we need some kind of information about the binding sites for AR1. And then the, that's the, the question is, where do we get those? And um, so I downloaded them from a data site called um, Jasper. No, Jasper's actually was created at, uh, by a pal of mine, Wyeth Wasserman, at uh, UBC, at the CMMT down here, uh, with other institutions. And basically what Jasper does, and what Wyeth is interesting, inter interested in, is uh, cataloging the binding sites for all transcription factors across the tree of life. We're interested in SAC, so when, if you go into fungi and you do a bit of searching around, you can get all the Saccharomyces cerevisia um, uh, transcription factors pretty easily and there's a nice utility to download this data um, as either a Jasper file or a meme or a transfac file. Meme, um, as I mentioned earlier today, is a pretty famous software package so I, I would guess and I was correct that meme would have a fun there, there would be a function to read in a meme file into R. So now, so I downloaded that using the wget that you guys already know. And if I go back to the, um, my, uh, um, uh, um, file structure into raw, I see I have this folder called tfbs and there's all these dot meme files here, a lot of them. And that's corresponds to the 200 or so transcription factors for um, uh, uh, yeast. Okay, so now we need to get these individual meme files into R. We could take a look at one of them just to show you. Let's just take an arbitrary one here. And this is what a meme file looks like. Um, basically, you have here um, ACGT along the columns, one, two, three, four. And then in this, this particular one, there's um, eight sites in the binding site and these are the probabilities per, per uh, for across the four nucleotides note that they haven't used any kind of pseudo count because you see zeros in here everywhere but this is for one transcription factor called arg81 okay so yeah uh right so now we need to get all of these files into um, our session so that's a bit tricky but there's some nice functions for that. So let's go back over here. Uh, to do that, I use this function called list files, which is part of the base R package. And if you, you point it to a directory like this TFBS and you give it a pattern dot meme, files now is equal to the name of all the, the directory and name of all the files. I can show you here. If I come in, it should be set. It is. See, that's the the path to every one of those files. There's a lot of them, so we don't need to do it manually. And then um, what I'm going to do, where I well, I found by you know Google search that this package called Universal Motif had a function to read in meme files, and that's called README. And here I'm just using this sapply function again that we've seen a couple of times. And what the sapply does is pass each of the file names individually in that long vector of files that we just looked at to this function called read meme. And then bsites is going to be a list that contains um, that data structure. So let's go back and take a look, uh, look at that um, just to make it concrete. If I type bsites here, if I ask for the, well, let's ask for the class of bsites, I see it's a list. If I look at bsites, the first entry, I can see that it's one, um, meme entry for the transcription factor ABF1. So that was easy. And now we have every transcription factor binding site in R in about, you know, about 10 minutes. There's no problem at all.
Now I need to do a little bit of searching here to find the ARR1 binding site, and that's what this function does here. It's using what's called an L apply, and I invite you to try and figure that out on your own time. It's, it's basically like the S apply, it's, it's, but it's applied to lists. Um, but you can, you can see here that when I print out the result of print AR1 um, binding site BS, I can see that indeed this is the binding site for, uh, this is the binding site file, the meme file uh, in R for that transcription factor. Okay, so, uh, you know, really uh, those two steps of getting Go and Jasper into R took about a half an hour. It doesn't take very long at all. And that's in large part because of two things. One, because we have good functions for reading in uh, these, these um, kinds of files, uh, both into the tidyverse and uh, because, you know, R has so many functions like, you know, this read meme file, etc., that are specialized for different standard um, formats out there. Okay, so you can look at the annotations for AR1. I put this here in the file. Uh, if you go back to SGG, this will tell you a little bit about what it does. It seems to be involved in response to arsenic and other chemicals. Uh, I won't, we won't spend much time on that right now. We don't really have the time. But um, so now I want to, I wrote a little function here called myscan. And myscan, I, I would invite you to go through it carefully. I'm going, to, I'm going to go over this quickly here because of time, but what MyScan does is it takes the, that, that meme data structure for the ARR1 binding site and runs it over Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, chromosome. So here I'm passing it the mitochondrial chromosome, and then I pass it the second time I call it to the third chromosome. This one's much longer and takes longer to compute. So what this does now, this function is basically uh, implements the sliding window that I was talking about in the lecture notes. So here I, I basically walk along the chromosome sliding this motif across and this code in here is basically computing the log probability that we looked at, the sum of the log, you know, the, the, uh, for each possible match of this motif across the genome and it returns all of those scores. Uh, okay, so then I could ask for chromosome three and chromosome, the mitochondrial chromosome, what the distribution of scores looks like. And so I'll, I'll use my, I'll create two GG plots like you've seen many times, two histograms, one for the mitochondria and one for chromosome three. And then I'll use the GG arrange to look at them side by side. And you can see that they are largely pretty similar. Their scores are below zero, which makes sense because we're, we're, there, we're always taking the sum of logs that are below, um, well, the lo their values are between zero and one. And so when you take the log of that, they're always negative. And you can see that basically they range from just below zero down to around minus 45. Now there's a little bit difference between the mitochondrial genome, and this is this guy here, and, and chromosome three. You can see a slight difference in shape. Now, and the mitochondrial genome is also shorter. But remember, if you recall from last class, we also noticed that the mitochondrial genome had a different distribution of, uh, or different GC content than the, um, than the other chromosomes. Okay, so, uh, well, that's interesting, but let's compare across some other transcription factors uh, just to, to kind of be sure. So I'll, I'll continue with ARR1, but I'll also look at XPP1. That's a, um, a transcription a factor involved in um, stress. NIT4, which I'm not too sure about, and RST2. So these are four different transcription factors, and I'll scan them over um, the, the first chromosome, all four of them, and I'll create four GG plots and arrange them side by side. And you can see that now, this is a bigger problem. Um, it's, you can see that their distributions are quite distinct. That both in terms of the range of values, this one goes from zero AR, this is ARR1, and it goes from zero down to about minus 45. But you can see here that this first guy, this would be XPP1, it has a much different shape, it has a strange, actually multimodal shape. And it doesn't drop nearly as far down. 
the problem here is that when there's different ranges, right, if this distribution is different, then what is our cutoff for calling a specific binding site as being real? So we want to use these scores to indicate where in the genome there might be binding sites for these transcription factors. And so if, for example, I were to say any binding site above minus 10 for AR1, that would say that these guys are real binding sites for the transcription factor. But that same rule may not work very well for the other transcription factors. For example, here on NIT4, there are no examples um, with, of binding sites uh, above minus 10. And that's almost also true for RST2. And that's not a very smart way to do it. So the problem really is that these, di these four different binding sites are very distinct in terms of their GC content themselves. So there's this nice package called SeqLogo. Um, it makes these uh, DNAograms that we saw. So here, this is the binding site for XPP1, and you can see that it's really fixed. TCGA has to be in the middle almost all the time, with a little, with quite a bit of variability in the first, sixth, and seventh nucleotide. If I look at NIT4. I see that there's quite a bit of variability on four and five positions, but it's very secure in positions three, six, seven, eight. And here you see for um, ARR1, it's kind of crazy. Only position four and one are really determined, and everywhere else it's really, um, it's really flexible. It's very degenerate. And finally down here, uh, RST2 has a whole bunch of Cs. So you might want to stop the video right now and ask, the, ask yourself the question, if, there's, if all four nucleotides are not equifrequent in the chromosome, which we know to be the case uh, in, in SAC from last class, how will that affect these different motifs? Some of them, like this guy here for REST2, consist almost, all, almost only Cs. And the other ones, for example, this guy here are equifrequent across all four nucleotides. So basically, the background distribution of nucleotides, which is not uniformly random, is going to influence how many binding sites that you see, uh, for depending on the actual motif that you're looking at. So the question then becomes, how do you fix that, right? How do you pick a way, how do you develop a method that um, that fairly compares motifs regardless of their GC composition. So I plotted here, I didn't plot, but I computed here using this function called al alphabet frequency. I think that's a biostrings function on chromosome one. And you can see that the GC content of chromosome one is only about 20% each, so 40%, whereas A and T are some 60% in total. So it's not equal at all. I mean, it, A and T show up roughly the same amount, and C and G roughly form the same amount, but you know it, they're different overall. And let, let's test that. So here, C and G are greatly diminished, and this motif for RST2 is all Cs. So I would expect that in our distributions above, we get um, uh, it's going to affect those distributions above. So where is RST2? That's the fourth guy here, and it seems to be uh, almost nothing um, above minus 10, okay? So, yeah, uh, how do you then fix this, right? How do you make it fair? That's the next step. And a common technique um, when you don't have a background distribution that's uniformly random is to, to um, calculate what's called the log odds. Okay, so it's not very, it, it's a pretty simple idea. It takes one little modification here. So if you have, um, before we were computing the sum of the log of P sub I, right? So we would walk along and we would look at the probability of each nucleotide as in the notes. But now we're gonna divide by the background frequency for that same nucleotide. So now we're gonna look at a ratio between the two. And, uh, I have some, I want to I stop very quickly for a few seconds here. I have a slide on uh, a, a handwritten slide to show you uh, and explore this a little bit in more detail. So I'll come back to that now.
Okay, so here's the basic idea. Um, over here is the our actual motif or the binding site. Okay, and for the, this example, it's, it's the same example we were using before. There's five positions in the binding site, ACGT. And this was our corrected pseudo count matrix where we added uh, um, P equal to one for each column. Now the background, let, let's assume that it was really equifrequent and we know that we just, we know that's not quite true, but with this example, I just put them all being frequent. And so the probability in position one of an A, a C, G, or T is all equal to one quarter. And that's true for every position. Um, we could easily change that to 0 0.3 for A and T and 0 0.2 for C and G from the actual empirical calculation of the nucleotide frequency. And that would be slightly better, of course, but it doesn't really matter for this example. Now let's compute the probability for this um, instance here, CTCTA. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the log ratio of the motif itself coming from this matrix um, divided by um, the background for the nucleotide CTCTA. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward to compute. You just It's the same as doing the log and I can write this out for each position from 1 to 5 and I can take, because it's multiplication, I can take the log of each of these components and add them together and so now we can we can rationalize about this first guy here. So what is the probability of um, of a C in this matrix? It's going to be one quarter, right? So this is one quarter here and the background probability for the nucleotide is one quarter so one quarter divided by one quarter is one, and so the log of this disappears, right? Okay, uh, so that's going to be zero. And now um, we move on to the second position, and we look here, and what is this? That's a T. So the T in this matrix in the second position is a quarter, and again, it's going to be a quarter in the background, so this disappears. C is a quarter in this matrix, and so it disappears too. This T is also a quarter here, so it's going to disappear the same way. But now at the end, we have this A. And in the, in the actual motif uh, matrix, it's two and a quarter. The background fre frequency is, of course, one quarter. So now it's two quarters divided by one quarter. And that is then, um, oops, sorry. Why is this not going, scrolling up? That is the log of nine. So the overall score for this motif now is uh, the log of nine, which should be, I guess, or just over three. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. So that's going to be a very different score than. Um, uh, do we use? Do we? We didn't look at that one above, but yeah. So that that one that score now is corrected for the background frequencies. Okay, and that's that's uh, that's as simple as that. So we're, not, we're no longer looking just at P of X, the log of P of X, but we divide out, in, this, in essence, that fraction of it which we think is um, going to be, uh, that's just basically due to randomness. Now, I mean, one thing here to think about is that this, score, this whole, st when you look at any one term like this guy here, um, if the probability in the model, P sub X, is greater than the background probability, this is a positive value. But it can also be the case, although there wasn't anything in this example, where P sub X could be actually lower than the background. And so it would make a negative con contribution to the overall score. Because if P sub X at I is less than B at X at I, the log of that's going to be a negative value. So it actually is detrimental to the overall um, uh, um, like value of the alignment or, or score of the alignment. And that makes sense because if the probability for the nucleotide at some position, whoops, is uh, is um, below what background, then it should actually be um, scored negatively. Okay, so we'll go back to uh, the um, uh, our studio session now. All right, so we're almost done for today. Uh, we left off right here, and that's this is just the equation from the slides I just showed you. And uh, in fact, in this universal motif package, um, there's a function called scan sequences, 
that if you give it the, uh, the mean um, binding site uh, data structure and the chromosome you want to scan, then it, it automatically computes this background for you. You don't need to do it yourself, which is kind of nice. So we don't need to use m this function that I created up here. This is, this is now out of date because my scan, it didn't correct for background at all, right? That was just a simple thing to get us going. Um, but now, down here, I can just use this really nice function from Universal Motif, and it'll compute the, 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 this, this equation um, at every site along uh, the chromosome that I pass it. Uh, as a side note here, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but this double colon notation, that's a way of saying that I want to use the function called scan sequences in this package called Universal Motif. I didn't actually need this here because it's loaded in the library, et cetera. But if there was some confusion as to what package I was referring to, it's a good thing to put explicitly what package you want. Uh, but you see that notation quite often. Here my threshold is one because basically I wanted to keep all the matches. Um, and th this is a p-value range, and p-values range between zero and one. So by setting this to one, I don't throw anything away because I want to use ggplot to then um, look at uh, all of these scores um, in this background corrected model. And so now, um, for example, here, this is for AR1. When I plot this now, what's interesting is that I have some scores that become above zero, right? And now that's possible because with the background, I can get, um, I can get, uh, I'm, I'm enriched above um, zero. So now we would be tempted to say any of, okay, so what that means if we go back to this equation is that the numerator across all sites is bigger than the background, right? That's why, because if they're equal, you're at zero. And if the background is bigger than the model, you're below zero. And so you can see here that the vast, 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 vast majority and there's hundreds of thousands in chromosome one of motifs are actually below the background probability. It's only very few motifs that are bigger than it. So what that would, what we'd be tempted to do here is say that any motif that scores above zero, that's enriched above and beyond the background, is, a, is potentially an actual binding site for that transcription factor. But before we go on, let's just take a look at our other um, XPP1, NIT4, and REST2 panel. So I did the same thing for those guys using this background corrected scan. And I can see here now that for some of them, well, actually all of them, but this one very few, has some motifs above um, background. So this tail to the right of zero in all four of these guys. So. Yeah, so now that's kind of a rational way or pseudo, you know, kind of rational way of saying, you know, what what matches in the genome might actually be real. So now but there's no guarantee that they're real, right? It just says that the motif that we believe is an actual binding site for that transcription factor is pretty strong in that position. So let's take a look at a couple of them for AR1. So here I've... Um, made it a tibble just for convenience so I could use filter and then I asked for the maximum score and actually here you can see that ACTGAAT is the maximum for most of these guys and that's the perfect consensus matching for the ARRT binding site motif. Well, let me show you if I scroll back here to the um, the meme matrix uh, well actually maybe this will do um, where is uh, that's NIT4, AR1, the, this is A, C, C, T, G, A, A, T. You can see it's the biggest nucleotide, the top guy uh, along here. And that's, that's kind of the consensus se sequence for AR1. And that's exactly the maximum scores are all the same, a score of 11.738. Now, this is, chrome, this is where it is on chromosome 1, 16,108 spanning to, um, to 115, those positions. So we could take a look at that. Well, not surprisingly, when I ask for that segment, that subsequence of the uh, a substring of the uh, chromosome, it is actually ACTG, 
AAT. Okay, it's just a reality check. But here, um, I can ask what what um, on chromosome one in my annotation file. So here I'm piping the annotations for the for the SC genome for the Saccharomyces genome into a filter. I'm saying, okay, look, only restrict yourself to chromosome one and give me back any annotations for the region minus 500 base pairs upstream of the binding site and down 500 base pairs from the binding site. And there's nothing there. So that would suggest that that's not a real binding site. It's unlikely because it's not in the pro, it's, it's nowhere near the promoter of a gene. Now in human, 500 base pairs isn't that big for a promoter. But for Saccharomyces, I think it's probably closer to 100 or 200 base pairs, and they're not, they're not really going to be probably active anymore. They're not real binding sites. So the mo motif exists in the genome, but it's probably not physiologically relevant. So I went to the second entry, which um, if you go back to this table, the second entry is at, at around 27,500 base pairs. And I asked the same thing, plus and minus 500, and nope, there's nothing there too. So two strikes. Uh, the third one also sucked, but the fourth one at 56,000, um, when I did that, I found that there is a gene um, on chromosome one that's not too far away. Uh, it's borderline. Um, but so, so then we would have to go in and ask what that gene is. Uh, so I, would, I went back to the table up here at 56,000, and that's this guy right Oops, um, I have to go to here. 56,000 is, oh, I don't know what's happened here. I've lost my, why isn't that showing up? Oh, here, sorry, it's there. Um, 56,000 in this table, and maybe I have to go all the way back. Okay, well, I, I don't think I have the information right there, but suffice to say is that it belongs to this locus here, and if I click onto this, it takes me to a gene called BO, um, BOL3 or AIM1 that's very close to that site. And, um, well, I, I, it's a protein involved in uh, iron sulfur cluster transfer, uh, damage due to oxidative stress. So it, it's really a distress. Uh, you know, whether there's any, relate, any reason to believe that the transcription factor AR1 controls pole three, I don't know. I mean, that would take some work. And that's a whole different problem of now trying to validate whether um, actually anybody else has found that already, or we would have to go in and really kind of do um, some experiments in the wet lab to really decide whether we believe that AR1 is truly regulating bull three, but it's definitely generates a hypothesis there. However, of course, you know, that's the start of a very complicated process that we would have to um, investigate in more detail. So that's where we're going to stop for today. But really, this all begs the question is, how do we model the performance of, uh, of this system, right? So, sorry, how do we measure the performance of this model? And as you can see here, the first couple guys just were big strikeouts. The third one is potentially relevant, but we would have to do more investigation. So then um, to go right back to the beginning of the lecture, at the end, we were saying basically, how do you evaluate, the, me the, the uh, measure the performance and, and try to validate um, the outcomes from the model? And that's where we're going to pick up next class is looking at that in more detail. Okay, thank you.